when I was growing up, uh, the uh, the BBC used to make this, uh, and, and still does indeed, make this great uh, sci-fi drama called Doctor Who. And the, the model of, uh, the, the centerpiece of Doctor Who, you, you may think, you, bear with me, okay, bear with me. Uh, you, you may think it's uh, slightly odd talking about science fiction uh, when we're gripped with, uh, with what's going on in, in fact. But the centerpiece of Doctor Who was this time machine the TARDIS, where you could uh, sort of go forwards and backwards in, uh, in time. So uh, with your permission, collectively, I'm going to put our three guests into the TARDIS, and we're going to land on the, uh, the south lawn of the White House on the, uh, the 21st of, uh, of, of January 2017. And um, uh, you're met by the new Secretary of State, Newt Gingrich. <laughs> who takes you into the Oval Office and, uh, and, and says, you've got, uh, you've got five minutes with, with, with President Trump. Pitch to him what you think uh, we should be doing in, uh, in Asia. And, uh, and uh, Ambassador Burns, let me start with you. What's, what's, your, what's your pitch to uh, Secretary of State Gingrich and President Trump? Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here at the Asia Society. Uh, I, the first thing I'd say to President Donald Trump is you should have invited Ambassador Nick Platt because he really knows Asia, and I'm glad to see him here. I'd say this. Um, Mr. President, our alliances are the foundation stone of American power. And so here in Asia, the United States has to recommit to the security of Japan, South Korea, Australia, to our defense relationships with Thailand and the Philippines, our emergency security partnerships with India, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, that this is the great power differential between the United States and China. China has no reliable friends in the world. And we, over 71 years, have built an alliance system. And Mr. President, what you said, and you have to speak truth to power very respectfully, but you have to, what you said during the campaign that Japan and South Korea should go its own, their own way and perhaps even develop nuclear arsenals, it cannot possibly be the policy of a Trump administration. That's number one. Number two, more bad news. I know you ran on a policy of trying to renege on all of our trade agreements, NAFTA, to kill the USEU trade, free trade agreement, and to kill TPP. But there's a strategic rationale for TPP well beyond the 1% to 2% rise in GDP that we might expect from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's 40% of global GDP. It's 12 countries. Prime Minister Abe, whom you, who you saw on December 16th in New York, had to push very hard the Japanese diet to get the necessary compromises to go forward. And the rationale is strategic. If, if you want China to be the major dominant trade country in Asia and write the rules of trade, which will be disadvantageous for nearly everyone else in Asia, then kill the TPP. If you want liberal market economies to write the rules of trade for the next 30 years, then advance the TPP and find some face-saving way for yourself to go forward. That's number two. Number three, that your relationship with China is going to be pivotal. pivotal. In, in this sense, we have to balance two competing priorities with China. We have to be, in a way, we have to look at China in the next 20 to 30 years as our most important partner in the world of 195 nation states on macroeconomic stabilization, on climate change, on trafficking of human beings, all the, the big transnational problems, China, because of its weight, is going to be our most likely partner as it was for President Obama and President Xi Jinping on climate change. So we have to engage them. And you, Mr. President, should invite Xi Jinping to sunny lands. You should do that. Invite him after you see the Japanese, Australian, and South Korean leaders. And you have to form some kind of strategic engagement. But here's the rub. China will be our largest and most important partner. It's going to be our strongest competitor for military predominance because we should seek, as a matter of American national policy, to retain our military predominance in Asia. It's vital we do that. And that gets back to the alliance system. And fourth, North Korea. If it's true, but most of us believe that within 10 years, North Korea will be able to um, have an ICBM that can reach Washington, Oregon, California, and the Rocky Mountain states. That is unacceptable. 
and therefore we must make it a, a matter of urgent national priority to deny them that capacity. And if that takes sanctioning China for its refusal to put the screws to North Korea, so be it. And that should be your opening line with Xi Jinping. Finally, don't go to Asia first. Go to Europe first. Europe's our largest trade partner. Europe's our largest investor. Europe's our largest collection of allies. Europe is facing much more severe short-term crises in 2017 than our Asian allies. Go to Europe first. Plenty to, to, to get to. Uh, it'll be Mar-a-Lago, not Sunnyland, though, I, I, I guess, for the, uh, no, for, the, right. uh, for, the, for the Xi Jinping summit. The Southern Ash White House. Right, exactly. <laughs> Ashley, anything, uh, anything in that list that, that you disagree with or, or, or anything else that you think he needs to, uh, he needs to hear from you? No, I, I concur with Ambassador Burns completely on the list. But I would add uh, two thoughts uh, to those that he just expressed. I think the president, uh, the president-elect, uh, the president at that point, uh, will have to make a strategic choice about whether he wants to make life easy for himself or more difficult. And that essentially boils down to a fundamental question about whether the United States is prepared to make the investments necessary to protect the liberal international order which we created since World War II. And I think I would want him to understand that protecting this order is of fundamental importance to American national interests. And that we did not build and we do not sustain this order simply as a favor to others. We do this first and foremost because it is in our own self-interest. And he can choose to gut the order uh, either through negligence or through acts of will. But that's not going to put him in a position where his own life is going to be easier if that's what he really wants uh, when he comes into office. So a real uh, renewal of the long-standing American commitment to preserve a rule-based regime in the areas of interstate behavior, in the areas of trade, in the areas of protecting security in the commons, I think is fundamental. And I think it's particularly important because of the discussion that occurred during the campaign where uh, the international order was seen as somehow optional from the point of view of advancing American interests. So that would be the first point I would make uh, adding to, to the list that Nick articulated. The second point that I would make uh, has to do with <coughs> issues of trade and economics. And again, the point I would make here is that the United States, at the end of the day, is a net beneficiary from the globalization that has occurred in the last 40 years. This doesn't mean that the fruits of that globalization have been shared equitably within our own country. And that is certainly a challenge that has to be addressed. But the way to do that is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The way to do that is to look at where the consequences of globalization have been deficient from the point of view of American interests and craft targeted strategies that allow us to address those lacunae. And so we need to, I think, get the president to rethink how he thinks about the larger questions of global integration and to recognize that the U.S. investments in creating that system of global integration first and foremost have actually advanced America's own interests and that it would be a pity to lose, to lose those benefits. And then there are other things that have to be said about our alliance system and the need to protect our capabilities. But I would go back to reassuring him on one point, that if you believe uh, that making America great again is not just a slogan, then he is absolutely right. He needs to pay serious attention to renewing the foundations of American power at home. There's no question. And if we don't pay attention to renewing those foundations at home, then many of the things that we want to do in Asia will essentially come a crop. So I do want to tell him that he was right. You know, the core objective of making America great again is wonderful. But I think the way he plans to go about doing it 
may not exactly be the right strategy called for in the times. And if he really wants to pay attention to making America great again, then I would suggest that we pay close attention to the imbalances in our public finances. We pay close attention to what is it we need to do to build a labor force that is capable of coping with the challenges of globalization, and that we pay close attention to what is necessary to improve America's capacity for innovation and productivity. And if he does that, I think we'll start off on a good on a good note. <laughs> And so you, uh, Secretary of State Gingrich turns to you and says, OK, we've heard what uh, Ambassador Burns has said about China being our biggest partner, but also our greatest competitor. Tell President Trump what they're thinking in Beijing. How will it be seen in Beijing? Will they, will they want and welcome a hard man, or will they actually want, um, are they looking for a partner that they can do business with? Sure. Um, I will start with analysis of how China and Chinese analysts perceive candidate Trump and now President-elect Trump. The Chinese surprisingly actually have a very positive attitude towards Trump. They see that they see uh, President-elect Trump as someone that they can do business with. That because he's a businessman, he's supposed to be very realistic, pragmatic, good at negotiation, and willing to negotiate on a lot of issues that the Chinese have been hoping to negotiate with, uh, with the United States with. And those issues include the role of the United States in the region, in West Pacific. And that goes to the fundamental question of um, who we think we really are. Do we still perceive ourselves as a, as a leader of the free world? Do we still perceive ourselves as an integral part of, um, of the region, of Asia? And if the answer is negative, then sure, China is rightly, rightfully very happy because <laughs> they will see this as a perfect opportunity to fill this vacuum that the United States will potentially leave. And that's uh, not a very pretty future for, for us Asia folks. Um, I would also like to raise with him that, so on China, the most important issue for the first 100 days is to set the right tone and set the right boundary and show China that this is not an opportunity that Beijing should just exploit and see it as U.S. vulnerability in terms of its Asia, Asia strategy and leaving China the space to expand. Um, then that goes to the issue of North Korea. I absolutely agree with Ambassador Burns on the severity and the seriousness of the issue. North Korea is on a very rapid track to develop real ability to deliver nuclear weapons to mainland United States. And once Pyongyang achieves that, that capability, they will cross a threshold. And the Chinese will have to be made, made to understand that this is an issue that the U.S. cannot just light and stay, stay there. But then we have to figure out do we, what do we see, see as realistic in terms of our negotiation or our approach <coughs> toward North Korea? If the military option is not an option, is at least not an immediate option, then do we consider the negotiation or dialogues with the North Koreans without denuclearization as the ultimate goal, as, as feasible? Are we willing to talk to them about the moratorium of their nuclear program in exchange for, for dialogues about a peace mechanism or a peace treaty? So those are the tough questions. Um, but sanctioning, sanctioning on China certainly will send a very clear message that they need to take it seriously. So let's just explore um, uh, the DPRK a, a, a little bit further. Um, as uh, you said, Nick, you know, when Jake Sullivan uh, was, was at the Asia Society back in uh, the summer, you, he was clear that for a President Clinton, North Korea would be at the top of the list for precisely the reasons that you mentioned. So how, you know, and, and, and given that we now think that actually maybe perhaps that threshold has already been crossed, yeah. that, you know, they all are already a, a potential, you know, they, they have a weapon um, and they are working on long term uh, or, or, or sort of, you know, they have medium range, they're working on long range delivery. How do you wind that clock back? How does hard man Donald Trump deal with hard man uh, uh, Kim in, in, in terms of winding back where we are now to a position where 
actually everybody can sort of breathe slightly easier. What's the advice to President Trump on that? Apart, yeah, uh, apart from sanctioning China. Yeah. Well, I think um, if you look at President Trump's agenda in 2017, it, the inbox is overflowing with complex, difficult issues. But the two really difficult ones, where there's no obvious way forward right now, are Syria, mm. how do we end the civil war, 12 million homeless, the Islamic State, American policy in disarray, and North Korea. And I don't know which <coughs> one is more difficult, but North Korea is exceedingly difficult because in, we had the agreed framework in 1994 that Nick remembers. We had the um, six-party talk agreement in 2007 and eight. I was tangentially involved in that as Under Secretary of State, but Chris Hill was our lead negotiator. They burned us twice. We negotiated in good faith. We had agreements. They violated the agreements. So fool me once, <laughs> right? Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on, on me. If we, go, we can't go down a third road, number one. Number two, the idea that we would roll back to zero, get them, convince them to roll back to zero nuclear weapons, I think is highly unlikely. Right given the nature of that regime. Third, our, our analytical, our diplomatic problem. You think about negotiations. With whom are you negotiating? I believe there's not a single person in the Obama administration or anyone likely to come into a Trump administration who's ever met him. The only American who's met him was a, was a pretty good basketball player, <laughs> but probably not the guy you want to negotiate. <laughs> Nuclear weapons, Dennis Rodman. And so that's an analytical problem because we know Xi Jinping is highly intelligent, disciplined, reliable, and rational. We know that Putin is cynical and aggressive and opportunistic and rational. We assume that Kim Jong-un is rational. We assume that we can practice strategic deterrence, but we don't know that for sure. We've literally never met him. So I would say this, John, uh, and I'm looking forward to hear what my two colleagues have to say because they're smarter than I am in this issue. From a diplomatic standpoint, we have to convince the Chinese that there's going to be a major impact on the U.S.-China relationship if North Korea attains the ability to threaten California with a nuclear weapon. And I wouldn't start with sanctions. You end with sanctions if, if, if all else fails. I start with trying to, get, to convince Xi Jinping that it's in our mutual interest to get into a negotiation where China really is beside us. I went to China and Japan and South Korea after the North Korean nuclear test in 2006. And I can tell you, I never felt the Chinese were really with us, really willing to put le you know, use leverage and pressure on the North Koreans to get them to back off. We've had a series of nuclear tests since then, a series of broken promises. So we ought to ask the Chinese to take the lead here and to guarantee us that at the end of a diplomatic process, which we might be involved in, where we need to meet the North Koreans open up channels in New York at the United Nations, and directly, if we have to, between Washington and Pyongyang, that China's going to make it possible for us to, to understand that that program is, is frozen, there'll be a moratorium on their nuclear development. If China cannot get us there, then I think, given the stakes involved in the United States, we would have to threaten China with sanctions. Can you, do, does, you know, it, the, the, the implicit or, or, or explicit uh, extension of, of what Nick is saying is that actually China really does have the leverage on, on Kim Jong-un to, to deliver this. Is that right? Is, is that assumption, that working basis, that actually by influencing China, the US can, can, can really make a difference in, in, in Pyongyang? Is that assumption right? This is a widely asked question. Does China really have the influence over North Korea? And there are two answers. One is, uh, and both of them are right. One is China does have the influence, and second one is uh, those influence cannot really be cannot really be used, because uh, the Chinese perspective on that is uh, we use the influence, we turn the screw on North Koreans, but to what end? If the North Korean regime collapses and there is going to be a unification of the Korean Peninsula, how is that scenario in China's national interest? So before they answer the question on North Korean nuclear development, there, the, the bigger question that hovers over the Chinese leader's mind is, um, what is the strategic arrangement on the Korean Peninsula in the future that will be in China's interest, basically without a U.S. ROK military alliance? 
and whether that is possible. If it is not, then the Chinese will find very little incentive. So let's just stop there and, and, and let's uh, sneak. If that's, you know, in, in, you're sitting across the table from Wang Yi and, 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 and the other sort of Chinese diplomats. What's your answer then when he says to you, well, why would we? Because actually, it may be in your interest, but it's not in ours. Well, we're not, you know, we're not talking about starting a diplomatic process that that uh, ultimately ends with the destruction of North Korea as a nation state. That's not our intention here. We're not into regime change. And we're into, Donald Trump's our president. He wrote Art of the Deal. What did he say in Art of the Deal? You start with your maximal positions. A lot of people think his threat of a 45% surtax on Chinese imports is just an opening negotiating position. He doesn't really mean to do that. A lot of people think that his ultimatum to Japan and South Korea nuclear weapons was an open negotiating position. Well, it's the same tack, I think, that Donald Trump would take with Xi Jinping in the first meeting. Mr. President, I want to have a relationship with you. I want our countries to be able to work together, but I need to tell you, the issue of greatest concern to me in Asia is North Korea with an ICBM pointed at San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, et cetera. And he needs to start there and get their attention. Now, the idea that we would agree to the unification of the Korean Peninsula and without a U.S.-South Korean military relationship, that's at the very end, perhaps, of a decade-long process. I'm not sure it's in our interest to agree to that. But you don't, have, you don't give that away in the first month or the first year of this negotiation. So actually, I, I was fortunate to go to Pyongyang in, uh, in, in August. And you know, these, the, the, my own observation was this is... You know, this idea that it's a hermit kingdom, that, you know, it's full of, it's weird. You know, it wasn't at all, actually. Some of the people I met, incredibly smart. And the thing that they kept saying to me was, actually, um, you know, the last guy who gave up his nuclear weapon, Gaddafi, was dead six years later. Why would we give up our nuclear weapon? Because, actually, in six years' time, it could be Kim who's dead. So how do you deal with that? I think that's a, that's a fair argument to make. <laughs> and, I would, and I would respond in two ways, one to Pyongyang and one to Beijing. To Pyongyang, I think part of the <clears throat> understanding has to be uh, that the U.S. will not pursue regime change if there is an understanding right. on the caps that North Korea is willing to accept with respect to its nuclear program. We understand the logic that's driving the North Korean nuclear program. It's essentially regime survival. I think we can, in good conscience, make the argument that we will not threaten that core objective if the North Koreans are willing to put substantial caps on the table. What is important to us, beyond the caps, though, is irresponsible North Korean behavior. And we have to address the question of behavior in tandem with what happens in the North Korean nuclear program. And I think we need to convey quite clearly that even as we are willing to concede that North Korea will have a nuclear program of some kind for some time to come. It cannot be accompanied by destabilizing behaviors that threaten our allies and which will call into question American credibility and resolve. To Beijing, the point that I think needs to be made to them is that if North Korea crosses certain thresholds of either capability or behavior, the risk of a cataclysmic outcome on the peninsula increases, and the United States will do whatever it takes to protect its interests and the interests of its allies in those circumstances. And the end result of that process might be exactly what China does not want to see, which is a collapse of the North Korean regime, a war in the peninsula, a upsurge in refugees, and ultimately American forces much closer to China's borders than they would feel comfortable with. And the only way to avoid that outcome is for China to use its influence now when it can, rather than let nature take its course and see what comes out of essentially an unstable process. And, and, and let me ask you about uh, because in, in a way, the, you know, what goes on and, and, and North Korea's actions inevitably impacts the U.S. relationship with China. So you know, they're very unhappy about the deployment of the THAADs, the, uh, the, the, the sort of missile defense system. What do you think? Is, is President Trump going to um, keep those um, 
uh, Thad's in, in South Korea. What do you think China will be saying to him? Clearly, they want them out. But do you think that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a negotiation to, to be had there? I think the Chinese certainly want to have a negotiation about that. But whether there is going to be one um, depends on how President Trump will define our national interest coming to the Korean, right. Korean Peninsula. But then the South Korean domestic politics is also in a little bit of turmoil just, these just, days. Just a little. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> so that's another variable that um, we're keeping our eyes on. Right. Do you think, there's a, do you think he will keep the Thads in, uh, in South Korea? I think he should. It's part of our leverage. In the second debate between President, uh, Secretary Clinton and, and Donald Trump, Secretary Clinton used the word, I think twice, leverage. She was referring to Syria. She was saying, we have no leverage, therefore we can't negotiate effectively, we have no weight. We're not in the game. I think President Obama made the right decision to deploy Thad, to decide to deploy Thad to the Republic of, to South Korea, because it's leverage. It, it tells the Chinese, this is a vital national interest of the United States. You have your vital interests, we recognize them. They're core interests, we know where they are. You always tell us about them. We're telling you. And so for Donald Trump, uh, this is a very effective opening gambit to say, we're gonna double down on that FAD deployment. We'll double down on the strength of American military forces in South Korea. If we have to, we're not, this is not an aggressive move towards China. It's to defend American vital interests in the Korean Peninsula. I think we start there. We should move on from those. We could talk about North Korea all night, but, but let's come on to, to, to another aspect of, of US-China policy and, and, and the South China Sea, because in a way it's a gateway into uh, a, a broader conversation about Japan and about, and about the, the Philippines. Um, you, you, what is it that, um, that you, let's put aside what you think China will want, put yourself in Donald Trump's head um, if that's uh, if that's a, I, I'm sure it's a perfectly. I'll try. We, anyway, we, we probably shouldn't go there. But put yourself in his footstep, in his shoes, then, if not in his in his head. How should he be dealing with China over over the the South China Sea and 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 the um, you know the rite of passage that uh, that that the U.S. Navy has been enforcing through the South China Sea. Mm. After the uh, international court's ruling on the South China Sea came out on July 12th, China's position or China's actions in the South China Sea actually had toned down a bit. But then there was a change of administration in, in the Philippines and a lot of the issues or the contentious issues between China and the Philippines have been quietly worked out worked out and there's a, and there's a table so that certainly creates um, a lot of questions for the US presence and US alliance with, with the Philippines. Um, but I think to begin with, uh, for President Trump, he should continue the freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea to send the signal to the Chinese that we, this remains to be our vital interest and we will continue to follow the phone ops to exert our, our uh, adherence to the principle that we believe in. So that's one issue. Another issue that has concerned people here uh, and in Washington is whether China is going to announce ADIS in the South China Sea. That possibility still exists. Um, so we should make it very clear to the Chinese that this is one of the red line issues that U.S. will not tolerate in the, in the South China Sea. Last but not least, China is most likely planning on continue the land um, island reclamation in the, in the South China Sea, especially, with, uh, con con especially related to the Scarborough Shoal. Um, although the Philippines seems to be more compromising on that issue now, but uh, whether U.S. is going to have a different attitude from Manila on um, possible land reclamation on the Scarborough Shoal is, uh, is an issue that I would like to hear Ambassador Burns for you about. Nick? Um, well, very simply, and I'm, I'm looking forward to know what Ashley Ashley's a, <laughs> says. I think that the American opening position should be to talk about the East China Sea first in a conversation with Xi Jinping and to say, Mr. President, you know, President Xi, that President Obama said in March 2014 that the Senkaku Dayu Islands fall under the U.S.-Japan Defense Agreement, despite the fact that we don't even recognize Japanese sovereignty in the Senkaku Islands just their administrative control. But still, that was a significant statement. And once President Obama made that statement in Tokyo with Prime Minister Abe uh, behind him, it really cooled the situation down. China was much less aggressive in the East China Sea. We need to, 
Donald Trump needs to repeat that phrase. We will fight for this, knowing that the Chinese would never contest the American military or the Senkaku Islands, uninhabited islets. On the South China Sea, I think it's a very different picture for us. We have to recognize that the Strait of Malacca um, is a vital strategic waterway for the Chinese, for Chinese trade, both two-way trade, oil, gas, and commodities, and Chinese exports and imports. We also have to recognize that the Chinese are going to be a presence there forever. On the other hand, we have to continue with freedom of navigation exercises. To It gets back to Ashley's point about the liberal global order. We have been the custodian of that order in the Western Pacific since the late 19, since the mid-1940s. And we have to tell the Chinese, we're going to continue this. We hope that Australia, maybe even India, yep. will conduct freedom of navigation exercises. But we want to create with you, Mr. President, some kind of process, multilateral. You can even decide what that is where the interests of the other five claimants to the Spratly and Paracel Islands can be discussed and debated. And even if that process goes on for five to ten years, if there's a process, it allows us to lower the temperature and reduce the probability of some kind of naval or air accident among all the competing uh, forces there. So I think to help China, what you often want to do in negotiations with a difficult adversary, help them. Create exit doors for them. Help them in this context save face so that the Chinese, who are, have profound interests in this area, understand we're not trying to threaten those interests. We're just trying to lower the probability of a conflict while maintaining our own interest in a liberal trading regime in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. So that's, I think, a very different presentations, East and South China Sea. I think there's a compelling argument to be made for creating a forum. Uh, wherein the regional players can talk to the Chinese about their equities in the South China Sea. We have to be present, though, in that conversation, because even though we are physically not located in the South China Sea, we have real stakes, as Nick pointed out, with respect to the character of the regime. Uh, so we've got to be party to that conversation. And the principles that I would lay out are, first, we would simply accept uh, as the, our own diplomatic foundation, uh, what the tribunal declared with respect to Chinese claims. That we would reject anything explicit or implied uh, that the Chinese assert uh, entails from the nine dash line. That has to be our going in position. We cannot concede sovereignty yeah. in any way real or implied. Uh, second, if China continues uh, to pursue a strategy of land reclamation, and particularly militarized land reclamation, then we have to seriously think about sanctioning Chinese entities that are involved in the construction activities uh, that, uh, that are currently underway. There are many entities involved. We know who those are. They ought not to get a pass. Third, we have to start uh, raising uh, the issues of China's behavior in all the functional forums that China and the U.S. are part of. Uh, forums that involve safety at sea, uh, forums that involve uh, fishing rights. There are so many functional forums that we have conversations in. We ought not to leave the South China Sea out of those conversations. And last, I would be much more aggressive in terms of our freedom of navigation patrols. I would not make them the exception. I would make them the norm. And I would encourage our allies to undertake their own freedom of navigation patrols as well. And to the degree that the politics permits, I would like to see coalition activity uh, manifest itself in joint patrolling. So that's more sanctions on more Chinese entities at a time when we're trying to get the Chinese to help us in North Korea. Remember what Henry Kissinger said, good politics is the successful management of contradictions. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's good. That's good answer. Um, look, we, we talked about Duterte and, uh, and, and, and the Philippines and his, uh, you know, in the sense that he has completely upended this idea of, the, of Obama's Asia pivot in, 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 in one stroke. Um, do you think President Trump and Duterte are just going to swear at each other? Or, or do, you think, do you think that will actually sort of create some, some opportunity for them to, uh, to speak a common language? <laughs> You, 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 you sort of, you kick us off. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to figure out. Um, 
Well, in terms of personality, Duterte does have a nickname that's uh, Philippines Donald Trump, right? right. So right. they're like Donald Trump from Philippines and Donald Trump from the United States. So in terms of the personality, there might be some similarities that will actually make them see each other as um, as uh, as someone that they can work with and someone they can respect because if they are that similar, then you have to assume that they right. like they like each other, maybe. <laughs> Can I, let, let, let's just cut to the chase there. You know, we've, we've talked a couple of times, and, and, and Tom, in his introduction, raised the issue about whether actually um, you, know, you campaign in, 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 in uh, poetry but govern in prose. And in the same way that Duterte was quite flowery in terms of what he said during the campaign, mm -hmm. but actually has been quite pragmatic in, you know, he's clearly done some things, but, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been a... Uh, an article of faith. Nick, do you think actually that what we've seen from Donald Trump over the last 18 months has been uh, rhetoric and once he gets behind that uh, that desk on the 20th of September suddenly actually he'll become far more pragmatic in terms of, of, of his approach not just to Asia but to, to all sorts of different policies? I think it's, I think it's really impossible to know. Uh, you know after 16 months of campaigning you do have to pay attention to what he says. Yeah. It is an indication of how he's going to govern. His consistent denigration of Japan. But he's been at that for 30 years. He was taking out full-page advertisements in the New York Times, railing against two countries 30 years ago, Saudi Arabia and Japan. And uh, he was convinced Japan was going to pass us in power, and was ripping us off 30 years ago. That's consistent. His denigration of the NATO allies, his praise for Putin, his praise for strong men, I take them seriously. And we, were, we had a discussion this morning at, at Harvard uh, with our students about this. And I suggested that, and I'm not trying to be flip here, I'm not trying to criticize him. I think it's just actual, an observation. He has a collection of ideas and opinions, and he's asserted them. But he doesn't appear to have any kind of a governing worldview of how to protect the liberal order, how to project and defend American power, how to act with difficult countries like North Korea or China. And so we just don't know. The other thing about him, about what kind of person he's going to be behind, be behind the desk at the Oval Office, the other thing we don't know is, and this is critical, who will be his Secretary of State, as Tom suggested, his Secretary of Defense, his Secretary of the Treasury, his National Security Advisor. Those people will be critical. If it's Chairman Bob Corker becoming Secretary of State, I would feel reassured. If it's Steve Hadley becoming Secretary of Defense, I'd feel immensely reassured. But even if he appointed those two very centrist, pragmatic, highly intelligent, highly capable people, would he listen to them? I mean, what, he's the guy who said, I'm not trying to continue the campaign here, but he's the guy who said, I'm smarter than the generals. I know, about, I know more about ISIS, he said, than the generals do. I don't think so. So the problem with, we, Nick and I served both as Foreign Service officers, advised various presidents, Secretary of State. It's a humbling job. It's extraordinary what you don't know. And so will Donald Trump actually listen to a Nick Platt on Asia, right? And, and that's going to be the test. And I, I, we can't answer a lot of these questions until we see him in action over the first couple months. I would say this about Duterte. Tran this transition might help Donald Trump and provide him with an opening. Duterte has been going around Asia saying, President Obama disrespected me. I don't know how that happened. President Obama is the most civil, genteel, polite person we've ever had in the Oval Office. But that's what Duterte is saying. So an, an initial Donald Trump opening to Duterte might allow Duterte to save face. He's respected me. Mr. Trump has taken me seriously. And maybe he backs off his threats to kick the American military out of the Philippines. Before we open it up to, to questions, Ashley, I, I want to talk about Afghanistan. Um, because, you know, it's, uh, w you could be forgiven for having forgotten that this is now America's longest war. Mm -hmm. Back in July, President Obama um, decided to draw a line on the plan to get most of the troops out by the time he left office and 8,400 troops are still going to be in Afghanistan when President Trump walks through the door uh, of, of the White House. Um, what is he going to do 
about Afghanistan. You know, the, the situation appears to be deteriorating today. A warning about from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul about a, a potential suicide attack on the Serena Hotel. You know, Lashkagar, a place I know very well down in, 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 in Helmand, you know, the Taliban literally knocking at the door of the district center there. Mm -hmm. We've been at this now for 15 years. When President Obama, uh, when President Trump turns to you and says, what do I do about Afghanistan? What do you tell him? It's without <laughs> doubt uh, extremely difficult and fraught decision. There's no question about it. And I think there are really only two alternatives, maybe two and a half. One alternative is to recognize that we failed and gracefully l limit our presence even more and hope for the best while building ever stronger walls in terms of homeland security so that whatever happens in Afghanistan does not come back to bite us or bite our friends. That's one option. I personally think it's an extremely risky option because you forego the opportunity to defeat your enemies at distance and you rely on the, um, on the calculation that you will be successful every time in stymieing them at home. So I would suggest an alternative which is to modify uh, the mission that we have currently given our forces in Afghanistan, which at the moment is purely a training mission. I would think seriously about some forms of combat support in addition to training. And I think when one does the arithmetic all over again, we would be able to sustain that modified mission of some additional combat support without a major plussing up of our troop presence in Afghanistan. We need to be cle clever about how we do it, but I think we do need to face up to the need for modifying the mission and staying committed to Afghanistan both financially and in terms of military support for some more time to come. So in the summer, when the president talked about uh, keeping them, there was a slight variation. So there are two missions, just to be clear, there are yes. two missions in Afghanistan, a counterterrorism mission yes. and the, the advice assistance support mission. And, right. you know, those 8,400, there was a slight rebalance mm -hmm. towards the counterterrorism uh, counter mission mm -hmm. in the summer. You're talking about a further, so in a sense, a further drawdown on the advise assistance support mission and a further ramping up of the, the counterterrorism mission? No, I think the counterterrorism mission will continue in any case. Right. It involves primarily special forces and our standoff capabilities. I'm talking of enlarging uh, the train and assist mission to include some forms of combat support because I do not think the Afghan National Security Forces as presently configured will be able to win the fight against the Taliban without American combat support for at least a few more years. And, and when President Trump says to you, this is where the rubber hits the road, Ashley, I've talked about how you know, the US is not going to fund, is not going to be the world's policeman. We are not going to let our NATO allies get away with basically you know, having something for nothing that actually it's time that NATO paid its way in Afghanistan and actually NATO filled the gap rather than us just pouring in more resources. What do you say? I would tell him, I would remind him that NATO did something in Afghanistan that it had never done throughout the Cold War, which is to use Article 5 obligations to right. come to our defense right. rather than the, than the other way around. Right. And the only time NATO forces and NATO as an institution began to think of a drawdown was in the aftermath of our own announced intention to draw down forces in Afghanistan. So NATO followed American initiative, not led it. And so the question comes back to me, which is what decision will the United States make? And if the United States doubles down on 
making certain that we protect what we have achieved in Afghanistan, then I do not think our NATO allies will be found wanting. Right. Um, there's lots we've not talked about, and we've got about half an hour left. You know, we could have talked about Iran, we could have talked about tension between India and Pakistan. Um, but let's, I've got a few questions here, but let's, uh, let's open it up to the floor. And if you could, uh, if you could please say who you are when you, uh, when you address the panel. There's a gentleman just here on the end of the, the row. Actually, I should say, could you please, just for the benefit of our, uh, our audience online, if you could wait until the microphone reaches oh, okay. you. Uh, my name is Bill Bruce. I'm retired, but I worked in, uh, lived in Singapore for a number of years and shipped each month uh, uh, to 100 countries, consumer batteries were made there. And I'd like to uh, bring you up, because some of the information you're passing on is, is, is not quite valid. The, the China Sea is controlled by the Pacific Conference in Singapore, which is made up of China and all the shipping maritime countries who ply that route. It includes Denmark, which has more ships on that route than anybody else. And they've been doing this for 100 years very successfully, and they don't really want not to have control. And, and the Navy, the U.S. Navy, pushing them in that direction is a very dangerous thing because you've got ships like these 130,000 oil tons, ships carrying that much oil. You've got uh, new container ships carrying 18,000, 22 <coughs> containers. You can have horrible accidents. You, 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 you're really going at this the wrong way. If you're going to sanction China for some reason, you're going to have to sanction Denmark, France, everyone else who's shipping that route. Just, just for clarity, I wasn't suggesting we sanction China, but, but no, thank you no, for, for... This fellow over here for, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the clarity. Yeah. Um, there, was a, there was another question uh, just over here on the, the right-hand side. On, on the right-hand side, just there, yep. Calvin Obama. Uh, what do you think of uh, Trump's idea of letting the South Korea and Japan uh, acquire their own nuclear weapons? Uh, a one-word answer from, from each of you. No, I'm teasing, but, but sure, let, let's keep the answers quite short. Um, Yun. Um, I think that's something that he said, but whether that uh, statement is going to transpire into real policy is still going to be, um, remains to be seen. And personally, I don't, I don't think that is going to happen. It's worth just saying that I think the mayor of Hiroshima and, or the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have both invited uh, Donald Trump to their cities to see <laughs> what, what might happen. Nick? I think it's one of the most dangerous things he said during the campaign. He said many dangerous things, Muslims, Mexico, but yeah. this... We, 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 he's already done damage. So he's going to take over on January 20th, having already done damage to American credibility. He needs to reverse that. And the people around him, his new, his new cabinet, need to convince him to reaffirm the American military nuclear support for Japan and South Korea. Ashley? I think we ought not to lose sight that what is at issue in the South China Sea is Chinese behavior. The last time I checked, I didn't see the Danes you know, militarizing islands. I didn't see the Danes... They're doing that to protect against piracy. That's a, that's a, that place right there is the narrowest part of the China Sea going into the Straits of Singapore and the Malacca Straits. And, and they need to do military those, are, those islands because they can't fly jets by just farther than 500 miles. Uh, to, to intercept the we, we just need to be, we, 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 our audience online can't hear you, sir. So let, let's, let's um, uh, let Ashley finish the answer. I, th I think that, well, let me, let me say a couple of things to that. First, Chinese behaviors with respect to interrupting international shipping, with respect to tailing U.S. Navy ships, all violate common understandings about what is required for the safety of ships at sea. It is extremely hard to make the argument that you need long runways deploying advanced combat aviation to deal with the threat posed by pirates. There's a very simple problem to dealing with the threats posed by pirates. It's called surface shipping. And the Chinese are free to use their surface ships to patrol international waters, just like every other Navy in the region proceeds to do. You don't need to build islands in contested territories, militarize the islands with air bases, and engage in provocative behaviors with respect to the U.S. Navy and other navies in the region. Okay, I, I'm going I'm to move us on. Let me, uh, let me ask uh, Nick a question that's come in uh, from Morgan on uh, email. Um, I'm going to sound like one of those uh, radio show, talk show hosts. <laughs> it's, it's moderator at Asia Society. 
dot org. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, uh, I'm sure he's not a f- uh, sort of uh, regular listener, first time caller. But uh, uh, Morgan asks: uh, Trump largely opposed the Iran nuclear deal throughout his campaign. How might election results affect Tehran's policies if the U.S. pulls out or attempts to pull out of the deal under his presidency? What is the expected result of it? Well, this is one of the issues I think that's got to be dealt with early by the Trump administration. If Donald Trump is serious about what he said, he wants to pull out of the agreement, here's who's going to oppose him. Theresa May, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, Vladimir Putin, and Xi Jinping. There are our five negotiating partners. And if the, the only rational way the U.S. could pull out of the agreement would be to reimpose sanctions. If Donald Trump traveled to London and Paris and Berlin said, please reimpose sanctions, the answer emphatically, led by Angela Merkel, would be no. This agreement is in our interest. We have bottled up, we've boxed up the Iranians now for 15 years. They've met the terms of the agreement for the last 15 months, and we're not going to be following you. So it would be an act of political diplomatic suicide by the United States. He won't be able to do it. It was a campaign pledge, which was not serious. Let's come to some, uh, some more questions. There's uh, a gentleman on the end of the road just here on the right. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. Uh, I have a, I'm a journalist, by the way, and my name is Manik Mehta. Uh, I'm wondering what will be the fate of the TPP under President Donald Trump? because there's a lot of concern being expressed in the ASEAN region and also in Japan. And today we heard uh, Mexico saying that if Trump is not willing to, uh, uh, to push the TPP, let's make our own TPP. What's your take on that? Um, who wants to take that? I would just say I think on this issue, he appears to be deadly serious. And he, be- he, he appears to believe fervently that the TPP is against American national interest, I think the present version is dead. And the best we can hope for is some kind of renegotiation among 12 countries. I'll bet this is high in Prime Minister Abe's uh, list when he comes here to New York next week. And you know what I would recommend in that January 21st meeting. This is a great mistake, but I think he's going to carry through with this great mistake. uh, Let me ask you a question from uh, Sacho, who uh, has... uh, has emailed the uh, Asia Society office in in the Philippines with a question. How would you address the question from children in the United States that say, how come I see when I turn over an item, I see made in China on most things? Why do I see made in the US on anything? Isn't this, is this, this is a question that wouldn't have been asked 30 years ago. Actually, I think I was playing with toys a little over 30 years ago. Most of them were made in China. But what's what's the answer to that question? How, how, you know, it's in a sense, the caricature of, of, of a Trump foreign policy is that it's going to be isolationist, protectionist, and we're going to see more stuff made in, in, in the U.S. But is that a good thing? And actually, isn't in the end, doesn't America's, I'm going to get told off for a loaded question here, but in the, in the end, isn't America's, doesn't America's future lie looking outward? I have two reactions to that. The first one is uh, most of the things have made in China tag on it because it's cheaper. So if it's uh, made in U.S., it will be significantly more expensive. So from a international trade perspective, that well, when it is made cheaper in China, we make them in China. And my second reaction is, uh, given China's own economic restructuring, the soaring cost of uh, the labor cost in China, soon enough it won't be made in China. Right. It will be made in Vietnam or made in Myanmar or made in other countries. Made in the UK, if, uh, yeah, if, 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 the, if the pound keeps plunging, I'll tell you. Right, let's take another question from the floor. Um, actually, there was a, a lady in the back in red who I, who I saw. Yep, yeah, just the hand, just there. Hi, my name is Dipali Srivastava. I'm a columnist for Forbes uh, Asia. I wanted to pick up on the question this gentleman asked about TPP. And clearly, this, it seems this panel believes, and, and uh, Ambassador Burns said so, it would be a great mistake scrapping it. But arguably, Donald Trump got elected on an anti-free trade mandate. And that was something that he shares in common with, uh, his supporters shared in common with Bernie Sanders. So 
if free trade and neoliberalism got us to this point, where many of us in this room are concerned about you know, the future direction and where, and uh, this collection of ideas that this president has, I mean, what is, I mean, how do you balance um, you know, this American interest in free trade with this backlash against free trade? Uh, which has really got, gotten you know, us to this point. Uh, isn't that the lesson of the election, that, that actually, rightly or wrongly, there is a huge section of the electorate on both the right and the left yeah. who feel as though America has passed them by and the world has moved on and they have been forgotten? More people voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. There's a size, there are a sizable part of our population that understands we have to continue to trade with the rest of the world. There's a sizable part that doesn't want to trade for the reasons you suggested. So it's not 90-10. It's split right down the middle. I think that President Trump's going to have a big problem here because he's going to be true to his campaign rhetoric. He's going to try to unravel or renegotiate aspects of NAFTA. That's going to be exceedingly difficult. And the, China, and the Canadians and the Mexicans won't go for it. On TPP, he will start with denouncing it unraveling it and trying to renegotiate it, I'll bet within two or three years he, or in four years his successor, is going to have to come back to the American people and say, of course we should defend our industries when we can, but we have to trade. When Britain leaves the EU, Britain's going to come right to the United States and say, we need a free trade agreement with the United States, between the UK and the United States. You know that. The European Union is going to want to have some kind of free trade arrangement with the United States if they can surmount their own domestic problems in Germany. And the Asian countries will as well. And if we don't do that, China will write the rules of trade. China, the great trade violator of intellectual property, and we will have lost for a generation strategic advantage to China. It's a pivotal issue, and we're not well positioned right now. We, 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 sorry, Ashley, let me just sort of ask one question. We, we touched on Trump's campaign promise about 45% tariffs on, on, on China and, and, and labeling China as a currency manipulator. Do we think that actually he'll, he'll, he'll do that? You, you talked about it being a, an, opening, an opening gambit in terms of the 45%. Where is it, where is it going to end up? It depends who his Secretary of the Treasury is and whether he listens to that woman or that man. Right. I can't conceive of a Secretary of Treasury wanting in 2017 to begin a four-year administration with a trade war with China. Right. Yeah. Ashley? I think we certainly ought to keep in reserve the option of doing difficult things with respect to China to address uh, questions of currency manipulation, to address yeah. the role of SOEs in a free trading, the state-owned enterprise in a free trade system, questions of IPR and so on and so forth. But President Trump has to ask and answer one important question. Will the United States, including his own constituency, be better off if he moves towards a more restrictive global regime in regards to trade? And if the answer to that question is no, that Americans as a rule, including his own constituency, will actually be worse off if we end up curtailing global trade starting trade wars, then I think a comp he can make a compelling argument to himself that his own interests are not served by pursuing the course of action that he's threatened. There's a second point. There is no doubt that the American state has failed the American people in one important regard, which is we have not invested sufficiently in mitigation. All neoclassical trade theory sh will tell you that the gains of trade will not be equally distributed within a society, which means that the state has a special responsibility for mitigation. Those uh, elements in society that don't right. gain from trading relationships need to be supported right. so that they are in some way made competitive. Now, if Mr. Trump can begin to pay attention to the dimensions of mitigation that we've lost sight of, then I think he will have actually served a public purpose. But as I said earlier, if the solution consists of throwing the baby out of the bathwater and destroying the global trade regime, I think the United States and his own followers will end up becoming worse off at the end of this process. And you, when, when the Chinese see Trump talking about 45% tariffs, see him talking about labeling them as a 
currency manipulator. You know, they're thrilled that now you know that that uh, the renminbi is now a, a reserve currency. How does that go down? The Chinese view that well, it's not the first time we've seen this, and it's not the last time we're going to see this. So, it's campaign rhetoric. We have developed developed a fatigue about this campaign rhetoric, so we're not going to take it super seriously. We're going to see what he's going to do after January 20th next year. And what's the potential, you know, if we do get into a trade war, and, mm-hmm. and you know, what is, what's, the, what's the Chinese weapon in the bank, apart from owning most of America's debt? Oh, uh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> um, there is a speculation that if uh, the, the tariff from the United States is significantly in- increased, then the Chinese will resort to the same mechanism to retaliate against the United States. And it will not be good news for U.S. manufacturers either. Right. Let's take another question from the floor. Yes, there's a, a gentleman just over there. Hi, my name is Clay Carroll. Um, it's about China. It's not a question about Trump, but he'll have to deal with China, so I guess it's about Trump. Um, China, over the last, you talked about the liberal world order. You know, it's been in place since uh, World War II. That's 70 years ago. A lot has happened in 70 years. Uh, China, you know, in the last 20 years, has become much more economically powerful, modernizing its military. Its actual foreign policy thinking is much more nuanced and different. You know, they didn't really have a foreign policy 15 years ago, they started from scratch. <coughs> um, how, you know, we talk about the two big issues we talked about is the South China Sea and North Korea. They're key players in both issues. Yeah. How have we and how should we recognize their increased strength? They're a very different country and the world order is very different today than it was 75 years ago when all this was set up. How should we recognize that and give them, you know, face or, or whatnot? And, you know, the extreme example is, you know, <coughs> You know, the Caribbean, like, what if the Chinese were, you know, running the safe passage of ships in the Caribbean? I don't think that would go over well. We have, you know, our Monroe Doctrine uh, that this is, you know, our region and that's how it works. You know, we were very strong at that point in time. Things have changed. How should we, how have we, how will we recognize that? Um, Yun, do you want to sort of tell us how we should at least sort of reach out and... and I agree with you. I think the um, the balance of power certainly has changed since um, the end of World War II. But in terms of comprehensive national power, you pointed out that China's economic power has increased significantly. But that's also a rather recent phenomenon. So has the, the comprehensive national power of China has increased in absolute terms and relative terms to the point that um, that the international order has to be completely reconstructed? I don't think even the Chinese want that. They have benefited significantly from today's global order, and they want to continue to benefit from today's global order. But they do want to reform certain aspects that they feel are no longer suitable for their (coughs) national interests. And that's why um, I think U.S. and China have engaged in dialogues and working level conversations on almost all these issues involved. So I don't think U.S. is denying China a new role in the in the international system. It's just it takes it takes dialogues for the mutual understanding or the consensus between the two countries to come through. Um, let me ask you uh, a question from Christine uh, Ashley. What is it? What is critical for Trump to do in the first hundred days of his term? It's a long list. <laughs> give us give us two. <laughs> that we've not talked about? I think the most important thing that he has to do is to convey to the American people and to the international community that the United States will behave as a responsible nation. That there is an, that there is a order that we have invested in that we are simply not going to destroy. And it's an order which has domestic dimensions and it's an order that has international dimensions. And if we were to gamble on radical modifications that do not involve forethought, we would all be the worst for it. And he would be the worst for it, because I'm presuming that as the President of the United States, he has a vested interest in being a successful President. And that's the point I tried to make earlier, which is he has to ask himself, does he want to end up in a situation where his life is easier or more difficult? Right. 
Um, if Barbara in Brooklyn is watching, you should keep watching because she's sent in a great last question, which I'm going to keep. But I'll, I'll take another question from the. Uh, I'm loving, lo loving this sort of uh, talk show type stuff. Um, yes, there's a, 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 a lady waving at me with the blonde hair. Ambassador Burns, good afternoon or good evening. Good evening. Krista Dowling here. I have a question about your, you mentioned Syria, but only mentioned it with its millions and millions of people of immigrants, yeah. which many of them wind up in Europe. How do you see a solution to that terrible problem between the chaotic situation there and the wars, civil wars? What do you see the outcome of that? Thank you. Well, uh, and I'll try to be very brief. This is a very big subject, and thank you for the question. I think along with North Korea, this is the hardest problem. And one of the big problems and, is that we are not present. I don't mean militarily. I mean politically and diplomatically. We've kind of taken ourselves out of the equation. That has left the Gutteries, the Emiratis, the Saudis, the Turks to go off in different directions, supporting different Sunni rebel groups. But you have this, and so there's no coherence on the side of support for the Sunnis. But on the other side, you have Bashar al-Assad, the Russian government, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards on the ground, and Hezbollah fighting in unison. They're more united, they're more effect effective, and they're more brutal. And we've seen that in the bombing of the humanitarian convoys in eastern Aleppo. So the United States has to get in the game, not with troop presence, politically. And Hillary Clinton did say in that second debate, safe havens to protect refugees, no flight zones. You could do this on the Turkish border with the Turkish government, the northern border of Syria. 12 million homeless in a population of 22.4 million. We are absent, and the Europeans are taking in over a million refugees. We've taken 12,500. That is not morally correct. The United States has always stood up on refugee crises since 1945. We haven't on this one. And now we have a government coming in saying, you read about it, and I read the Times and the Wall Street Journal this morning, they're thinking of shutting down immigration, much less refugee intake. And that is contrary to the traditions and the morality of the American people when we see people in crisis beyond our shores. So it's a big subject, I'd say that. To you, we can talk about it offline. Uh, if you'd like. I'd just like to say one thing. I agree so much with what you said about China. Ch we need to reach out to China and say to the Chinese, please help us run this international system. And I think President Obama has been very skillful in doing that. The first ever big joint venture we've ever undertaken with China was the, the climate change joint venture. We sh why shouldn't there be a Chinese president of the World Bank? Why always an American? We need to share some of this power to invest China in the liberal order because China has profited from it. If we say you can't run the World Bank, you can't be in charge of anything, then they're going to go out and build 10 more AIIBs. And, and I wouldn't blame them if they did it. So President Obama, has, he's very enlightened on this issue. We're going to miss him a lot, I think. <laughs> and you know, there are times when we have to be tough with China. There are times when we want to make China. We want China to be right with us. And this, here's one of them, I think. So um, we've got about five minutes left, and, and Barbara in Brooklyn asks, where might there be windows for cooperation and optimism in Asia that a Trump presidency would bring? Um, Ashley, let me, let me start with you. Well, let me Give us some hope here. Let me flag <laughs> something that Ambassador Burns was actually pivotal in building, which is the opportunity for a new relationship with India. Uh, we've made investments over the last 20 years in building that partnership. It's yielded fruit already. There is much more that we can do together. Uh, the Indians want it for the first time after a long time. I think we ought to double down on making the promise of that relationship real. Uh, two, I think there is enormous scope for a productive relationship with China. Don't get me wrong. But I think the liberal order, by its very constitution, gives China that opportunity if it chooses to accept the principles of that order. And so what we ought to do is focus on Chinese participation on one hand, but also on Chinese behavior on the other. And if we can keep those two in balance, I think there will be enormous opportunities to work with China both on regional issues and a variety of functional issues uh, around the world. Prime Minister Modi was one of the first 
leaders that that uh, Trump spoke to yesterday, did that give you hope that that actually you know he is actually engaged in 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 doing what you say in terms of thinking of of investing in in the India relationship? Well, time will tell. <laughs> um, how are they going to get on? Because in, in some ways, they're both larger-than-life characters. I think they'll get along famously. <laughs> I think at least Mr. Modi would like to see uh, President-elect Trump at, uh, sooner rather than later. I hope President-elect Trump feels the same way. I think if that happens, I think it will be a very good first step. He's the rather the more stylish dresser. Yes, he is. <laughs> You, what about you? Where do you see the signs of, of, of optimism here? What is it do you think Donald Trump can do that President Obama hasn't been able to do in Asia? Um, I know that the Chinese are hoping that they can negotiate with him on um, issues um, that the Chinese, well, the Chinese understand are principle, matters of principle for the United States. And I agree with Ashley. I think there is a great need for China to be incorporated into the system and follow the rules. Although the Chinese will be very antagonistic against the idea that, well, here are the rules and you need to follow them. (coughs) Who made you the referee? You are an equal member as we are. So I think it probably will take more, I had to use the word, negotiation, Mm -hmm. like President-elect Trump has used a lot. We will negotiate with with Chinese on on these issues. Nick, are you? Well, I was going to say you optimistic. That's probably the wrong. But so talk about where do you think there are areas of, of, of optimism? I think the United States under President Trump has two big strategic opportunities because we are going to have to have a difficult relationship on the competitive side with China, and that is to rebuild the basis of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Who better? It's a Nixon to China moment. Japan's greatest critic in the United States has been Donald Trump. If he and Prime Minister Abe can see their way forward where the United States would support the emergence of Japan as a military power. I think it's very positive for us. Reaffirm that U.S.-Japan defense alliance. George Shultz used to say, the most important relationship we have in the world was with Japan. I think in some ways it's still true. And that will help. That will send a very useful signal to the Chinese. We've got other options, and we are grounded in this region. And the second, and Ashley has been a pivotal figure in two administrations on this, is the most exciting strategic opportunity worldwide is the U.S.-India relationship. The two largest democracies, India will be the largest country in the world by population, overtake China in the next five or ten years, rule of law society. It wants to align, Mm -hmm. not a lie, with us. And there's, there's, we are beginning to see a triangular relationship, Tokyo, Mm -hmm. Delhi, Washington. Air, Air cooperation, naval cooperation. We don't want to fight China but we will prevent China from dominating Asia in the next 50 years. That's tremendously positive for the United States. Donald Trump can do both things. Well, who'd have thought that we would end on such (laughs) an (laughs) upbeat moment? Thank you. uh, Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you to to those of you who've been... uh, watching online and thank you to to those of you who've asked the questions in the room and uh, and online so again thank you to the panel <laughs>